encourage you to start at 16.45, so we will do that. Um, my name is Marion Oswald. I'm a lawyer based at the University of Northumbria um, in the UK. Uh, and I'm someone with a very loud microphone, David Carroll. I'm a police officer uh, in Hampshire. For those people who don't know where that is, that is a medium-sized police force down on the south coast uh, in, the, in the UK. Uh, and uh, whilst I'm at work, I have a day job. A part of my other job at work is uh, leading a project to build a machine learning algorithm to forecast the reoffending of domestic abuse perpetrators. So hopefully you're all here um, for this tutorial, can an algorithmic system be a friend to a police officer's discretion? So um, our aim in this session is to think about the importance of discretion in police decision making and to think about how we can guide ourselves um, in building algorithms that can be friends to that discretion. Um, so, so when we say algorithms, we're, we're talking specifically about machine learning. We're not interested in artificial intelligence in the more theoretical and future sense. So we're very much focusing around machine learning that is in um, development now. So in this, in this tutorial, we're going to look at the, the legal concept of discretion within police decision making. And then we're also going to think about the realities and contexts in which discretionary decisions are made. And as um, Dave said, we're going to look at a real um, machine learning algorithm that's in development within a, um, a domestic violence context. Um, and then we're going to ask you um, in a number of groups to think about um, design decisions and features which may help or hinder the legitimate exercise of police discretion and to think about the implications for the choice of things like data inputs and ex um, uh, explanation methods. So this is how we're going to um, structure the tutorial. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about what we mean by discretion. Then I'm going to hand over to Dave who's going to talk about the domestic abuse operational context and the, and the tool that's in development. Um, then it'll be back to me to talk a bit more about the law, but um, don't worry, that's only going to be very brief. And then we're going to be back over to you to think about those real practical decisions um, to help uh, algorithms become uh, a friend to that discretion. So what, what do we mean by discretion in this context? I thought I'd start by telling you what we don't mean. When we're using this term discretion, we don't mean things to do with keeping things secret or confidential. That's one use of that English word discretion. What we're actually talking about in this context is the power or duty of a public sector official, such as a police officer, to make decisions based on their own opinion. So that's what we mean by discretion. And of course, that, that power or duty is always subject to legal boundaries and legal constraints within whichever legal system um, the police officer is working. So some of you might be thinking, well, uh, what are they talking about? Why, why is this concept of discretion um, important, why can't uh, police officers just follow the rules? Aren't there just rules out there, they follow them, it's all simple. Uh, why do they need this concept of discretion? Well, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. Um, rules can't apply, in, uh, can't cover every scenario that a police officer is going, going to face out there in the real world. And this concept of discretion, um, as M Murray Hildebrandt said, recognises the fallibility of interfacing rules with their field of application. So it recognises that rules um, become less easy to follow when you get that out there in the real world. 
So, and the law often requires the, the officer to make a judgment um, in a particular context uh, around such concepts as reason, reasonableness or risk. And so this concept of discretion um, allows the officer to consider the merits of the case and make sure that rules are not apl applied unbendingly. So um, it allows individual circumstances to be considered. And in general, the police have to use their discretion as regards prioritising and deployment of resources and de deciding what the policing function needs at any particular time. We've put a quote up here on the slide from um, the UK College of Policing Authorised Professional Practice, which is guidelines that, that help police officers in England and Wales um, do their job, basically. And, and this, um, this document recognises the complexity of police decision-making and that decisions are required in difficult circumstances, often based on incomplete or contradictory information. And decisions might be required in circumstances where those involved deliberately mislead or try to mislead them. You can see on the slide there, the picture on the top left is um, a shot of the of Westminster Bridge attack last year, where the attacker was somebody that was attending uh, a rehabilitation course run by academics um, and then unfortunately um, attacked those people um, operating that course. Um, the other pictures on that slide are really um, intended to illustrate this complex and difficult um, circumstances in which the police are offering, often taking decisions. So I'm going to hand over now to Dave to really um, illustrate further those, those circumstances. Thanks, Maria. So I'm going to spend about 25 minutes trying to put some operating context on why this particular machine learning algorithm forecasting tool has been built, um, to talk to you, about, to you about existing risk assessment procedures in policing to assess the risk of domestic abuse to a victim, and then also to show you how a machine learning algorithm might improve that process by offering a more accurate risk assessment, and then we'll have a case study about what police officer decision making looks like at the point of contact for domestic abuse, how tricky that can actually be and where this can help in real life. Having uh, come to a number of places now uh, in the last couple of years to talk about this sort of stuff and a lot of academic conferences, what I usually find is, is we talk in the abstract and we talk in the theoretical instead of firmly rooting that in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, and what we also tend to do when we look at algorithms is we are in danger of telling a story about all the bad things that might happen if we deploy them and we forget what the potential weaknesses are in our current system that we're trying to fix. We forget to compare the two and see what the relative advantage is. So hopefully we're going to cover some of that as well. So domestic abuse operating context in numbers, uh, certainly where I come from, looks a little bit like that. Um, and that graph uh, clearly shows you, doesn't it, that uh, around about January 2015, there is an enormous surge in the reporting and recording of domestic abuse. Uh, and that's pretty much reflected nationally. And I'll just talk to you a second about why that graph looks like it does. But just some figures on the, on the right-hand side. You look at the costs associated to the UK with domestic abuse victimisation, £66 billion. And that's not just a criminal justice response, that's a health response. There's a lot of socio-economic costs in there, not forgetting the human misery that goes with that. Uh, and every year, uh, last recorded figures in 2017, 2 million adults experience domestic abuse in the UK which is a phenomenal amount. And bearing in mind there's a lot of under-reporting in domestic abuse, you can imagine that figure is actually probably higher. And then in Hampshire, just to let you know, since 2014 we've had a 70% increase in all crime. Now a lot of that comes down to much improved recording practices, but a lot of that also comes down to what you'll see is, is a shift, a strategic shift in policing focus in the UK from just concentrating on traditional crimes like burglary, robbery, theft, those sorts of crimes and a real shift into hidden crime and vulnerability where there's under-reporting, we have to go look in uh, and uncover what that really means. So in 2015, uh, that focus comes into policing, much better recording practices, 
sees that huge rise. But in domestic abuse, that's a much higher and faster rate of rise than you see in all crime, just to show you the extent of that issue and how it looms large uh, where I am. Um, and within that, 20% of those cases, and sometimes more, are high-risk cases. And I'll come on to talk to you about, um, about the risk stratification and what that means. But of course, within all that, we've got to provide a service to victims. We've got to focus on perpetrators. And uh, our resources, like everywhere else in the world, are finite. There's only so much we can do. And the only way we can organise ourselves is through risk-based triage. And domestic abuse is one of the very few areas in law enforcement, where the, and in fact, within our other agencies that help us, where the entire response is driven by a risk assessment. And often, a risk assessment that is triggered at the initial point of contact between the police and when the victim reports. So it also follows, if we are to focus on the most highest harm perpetrators, if we are to protect those victims most at need within a finite resource landscape, and we're entirely risk assessment based, then we need to have the absolute best risk assessment we possibly can in order to guide that response. Make sense so far? Yeah? So, the current uh, domestic abuse risk assessment tool that is the risk assessment tool of choice in policing and with our other agencies that we, that we use, like children's services and social services, uh, is a domestic abuse, stalking and harassment introduced in 2009 and it risk assesses the likelihood of serious harm. Not the likelihood of re-victimisation at any level, not the likelihood of a perpetrator reoffending, but the likelihood of serious harm being caused to the victim. It's a measure of risk. And risk is the likelihood of something happening, along with the impact that occurs when it does happen. And that's our standard definition of risk that we work to. So um, high means that that risk is imminent. Medium says serious harm risk still exists, but it's, it requires a trigger to make it happen. And at the bottom, standard risk. A victim is at a standard risk of, of being caused serious harm in a domestic abuse setting. Does anybody actually know what that means? What's the standard risk of being caused? Because I don't. The reality is that is translated uh, in policing uh, as very serious at high risk, not so serious at medium risk, and a pretty low chance of happening, full stop, at the bottom. And those risk indicators there uh, show you how the risk assessment is constructed. A police officer will go to a, a report from a victim. They'll have a questionnaire there with 27 questions. They're going to ask the victim yes or no questions, but they have space to put in a qualitative um, narrative. And from there, they're meant to identify 13 indicators of serious harm. Uh, and you'll see there. Can you read all that, what those are? So plenty in there. Uh, the interest to take a view, uh, you don't have to call it out, of how much of that a is um, computable, can be reduced to code, uh, and B, how much of that are you really likely to be able to draw from someone in an emotional setting where they've just been assaulted, the perpetrator may or may not be present, there may be children in the house, really, really difficult to get into some of these issues uh, with victims in that emotional environment. And from all that, the police officer is left with um, doing some maths and following some indicators. So, you know, we talk about the constraints of an algorithmic output. What are the constraints for a police officer at the scene if they've, uh, 15 or more of those questions are positive? That's a high risk. You've got to follow that. Or, oh, hang on a minute, I've got two or more incidents of three, four, five, seven, and nine. Oh, six or more incidents in the last three months. So quite a lot to weigh up, but actually very prescriptive in terms of an officer's um, decision-making. Um, so an awful lot in there. And that's one of those really annoying slides, right? That when you actually put it in, first of all, you think that's really good, that would be really helpful. And then when you see it up there, you think, well, no, it probably won't be because no one can read it. Uh, if anybody's interested in that, I, I do have a printout that I can give out afterwards. But what that does, it just actually does what it says. It's multiple deployment and decision points where a police officer or someone involved in law enforcement will make a risk-based decision on what we should do next with a victim or a perpetrator. And that goes from receiving a call in the control room, top line, Second line down is police officer at the scene. Uh, third line down, we then get to uh, investigation so in a custody environment, making decisions about prosecution. We then get down to number four, where we're going into our intelligence processes and checks. Number five is where we do other checks with other agencies. And number six is where we get into a multi-agency environment where we risk assess together 
with other agencies like children's services and health and, and, and other uh, professionals. And, and there's just so many points in our process around DA where individuals make decisions based on individual judgments that they make in that set of circumstances. And that is fundamentally going to be suboptimal conditions for making a consistent risk assessment based decision. So that's, that's, that's not to say, of course, that there isn't a lot that is good about what we currently do. But having done that analysis, the, the question um, uh, shows that you know, there's a greater need to support individual decision makers when making risk assessments and identifying risks posed to victims from perpetrators. On the left-hand side, we've got some of the factors uh, that impede that. On the right-hand side, we've got some really important factors that exist in the current risk assessment process that in the development of any algorithm, you would absolutely want to hold on to. So on the, on the left-hand side, uh, there's a fair bit of uh, evidence-based research out there that looks at uh, the DASH risk assessment to see what it generates and what its accuracy is as a predictor. And the people who designed the model would say this is not designed to be a predictive model. But, but I would argue, uh, whether by accident or design, that's exactly what it is. Because if someone tells me as a police officer that a victim is at high risk of serious harm imminently from a perpetrator, then I'm going to do something about that. And if they say, you don't need to worry, actually, because there isn't really any risk, then I'm not. And it's an assessment of what's based in the future. Therefore, I would argue it is predictive whether it's designed to be that way or not. But the, the problem with it, that the, the, the false positive rate at high risk is really high. So false positive, we say something's going to happen, and it doesn't. We say a victim's going to suffer high harm, but they don't. And consistently, that's up in the 90 percentage points of being wrong. The assessment is made, it never happens. Now, arguably, you could say, well, the reason it never happens is other agencies intervene and stop it happening. But when you look at the reoffending rates at high risk that aren't serious, they're actually quite high. And when you get consistently 90 to 99% false positive rate being reported around the country, you have to start to question yourself as whether we're over, over risk assessing. And of course, if you're on the end of that, then you know, there's some quite um, serious and interesting implications for that. As I said before, the tool only assesses serious harm. It doesn't actually assess the risk of reoffending. Uh, there's one point here that I've got on, on both sides in terms of, of a good and, and potentially an inhibitor. Uh, the whole thing uh, is designed to risk assess perpetrator's behaviour through the eyes of the victim. Now, in one sense, that's really important, like, fundamentally important, because, of course, the victim is potentially your best source uh, of giving you information about that risk, how that risk is presented. Uh, but we know it's not always right. We know it can be subject to other factors, and we know it might not you know, also always be independent. Uh, and we also know that the completion of our 27-question risk assessment uh, is, complete, is you know, influenced by a range of factors. So it's not just the emotional state of the victim. It's the environment in which they're taking uh, that risk assessment, as I've talked about. It also depends on the officer's attitude to domestic abuse. And it is fair to say that you know, in law enforcement over the years, not just in the UK, but uh, you know, abroad and internationally, there is a range of attitudes from police officers around domestic abuse. Uh, most of it is fantastically professional, but there's still, there's still some people have a slightly different view about it and how, import, how much importance they place on it. And of course, there's the bit around competing demands. So often police officers will arrive at the scene uh, of a domestic incident. They'll have a number of other serious incidents that they're being waited to, de to deploy to. And uh, because of that, again, that can affect how much attention they put into what they're, they're doing at the moment. And as I've talked about, it is a suboptimal predictor of, of domestic abuse re-victimisation. Um, one thing I forgot to put up there is that 20% false negative rate. So one in five cases where the cops will say, actually, nothing's going to happen, or something might happen and it's not that serious, so don't worry about it, but something really serious does happen. The worst sort of error you can ever make is a false negative at high risk. No serious harm is going to happen here. It's fine. But actually, that's exactly what does happen. Dangerous errors. On the right-hand side, the voice of the victim, really important, and that captures... If you remember that slide I showed you with all the honeycomb pieces, it captures all of those uh, factors, that life experience, that experience of the victim in that setting, and we draw that out. And that's useful. It, it is some use for risk assessment, 
but it's also useful in safety planning and responding to the victim's need outside of a prediction of what the perpetrator might do. Um, risk framework and assessment criteria is common across all uh, professions that are involved in domestic abuse. So everyone is talking a common language to a common uh, framework and it does identify factors that are correlative to domestic abuse. So all those factors in there absolutely correlate with domestic abuse. Whether they are predictive of perpetrator reoffending is another question. So we had a look at how can a machine learning algorithm provide support to police officers in improving a perpetrator-based domestic abuse risk assessment. Uh, so we can improve the police service to victims by better identification of risk, better identification of victims in need. We can rebalance that risk in the system. You know, I said it was 20%. At times, that's gone up to 25%. In some of our inner city areas, that's up to 27%, sometimes pushing on 30% of all cases, which is a lot. And we can actually have an assessment that predicts the risk of domestic abuse reoffending focused on the perpetrator, an independent assessment focused on the perpetrator that will be time-bound as to whether that perpetrator will commit an offence over the next two years. Uh, really important, two really important things I always have to say when I, when I do this, when I do this for domestic abuse professionals, is definitely not a replacement for the existing risk assessment process because that, as I've said before, is a number of, of qualities and benefits that we like and we want to keep, notwithstanding the fact you know, we have 43 police forces in England and Wales, 43 police forces, the vast majority of which use that risk assessment tool, the vast majority of other agencies we work with use that one, and why would we try and, um, why would we try and rep want to replace that overnight? That would be folly. Um, it's not a replacement for human being decision-making. It's really important. It's absolutely a supplement. And it's not a prediction for that current DASH questionnaire. So, this is what we designed, not me. If, you, if anybody asks me a question about data science here, I, you'll be wasting your time, okay? Because <laughs> I don't know anything about it, or very little anyway. Um, but there you go. Classifying the risk of domestic abuse reoffender for multiple data points around victim, offender, incident, criminal record. And the, the honeycomb shows all the places we go to get that data. All of that data from, from there and above uh, is information we just collect in our criminal records database as a consequence of turning up to a domestic abuse incident or any criminal incident uh, involving victim and offender. And the bit at the bottom is where we also added in the uh, current risk assessment uh, classifications we have and we put in all of the 27 questions from 90,000 dash forms collected uh, over 11 years from attending domestic abuse incidents. So if people say to me, where's the voice of the victim? in the algorithm, it's pretty impossible to have a voice of a victim in an algorithm, but I think we've collected the voice of a victim in that hard copy that's, that's gone on there, and we put them all together. And what we're trying to risk assess, you can see up on there, um, is different. So when we say high risk, that is you will commit a serious domestic abuse offence within the next two years. And when we say a serious domestic abuse offence, there's some of the examples. Arson, rape, homicide, grievous bodily harm. When we come down to medium, we say, look, this person is going to commit an offence within the next two years, but it's not as serious as those. So if you wanted to you know, go left or right as to where you put your resource, you're up into the high risk, down at medium risk, they're going to commit crime, not so serious. Difficult conversation to have in domestic abuse, and quite rightly, because you know, domestic abuse is a serious, serious matter. And at the bottom, uh, we're unequivocal about low risk. So we're a standard, arguably that's quite ambivalent and open to interpretation. Low risk domestic abuse perpetrator will not offend again in the, in the two years following the reported incident. Of course, what's really important is the big so what on that. You, know, you have to be able to show, albeit it's not an exact comparison, how one maps out against the other. And so this is what we did. So on the left-hand side, we take our current uh, risk assessment process 35,500 domestic abuse occurrences, they're actually crimes, with a named suspect attached to it and a dash risk assessment that is attached to that uh, suspect, high, medium or low. Uh, on the right hand side, I'll put AI up there, Marion would tell me off for that, it's our MLA modelling, slightly uh, smaller data set in time range and we did that because the data quality uh, in 2009 wasn't great. As you start moving forward and we get better at it, the data quality <coughs> improves. 
62,500 domestic abuse occurrences with named suspects, the DASH questionnaire data, and then all the data from those uh, various uh, criteria I showed you on that last honeycomb. Put it all together, it's about uh, seven or eight million data points we've got going on in our algorithm. So again, risk assessors, high, medium, and low, accepting that the two are slightly different, uh, but what do, they, what do they show us? Uh, well, I've already talked over here about uh, the accuracy levels, the current DASH risk assessment, and the overall accuracy level, so DASH said this, what happened, pretty low, uh, replicated uh, what we'd previously seen in terms of uh, false positives at high risk, and a fair amount of false uh, negatives as well. The, the machine learning risk forecasting model improved our overall accuracy of predictions by 25%. I've got about 50 different versions of this I, I could use, which all kind of balance the risk in slightly different places. But, uh, but you know, the most accurate one I had uh, most recently, 25% improvement overall accuracy, reducing our false positives by 60%. Reducing the same amount of uh, false negatives. Uh, greater accuracy of predicting low risk. This is really interesting. When the, when the algorithm says the domestic abuse perpetrator will not reoffend in, in the following two years, it's accurate nearly eight times out of ten. So I'm not a world-leading expert in the accuracy of criminal justice-based risk assessments, but I haven't seen one as high as that. So in the world of predicting human behaviour, that's pretty high. And within the algorithm as well, we can rank uh, the most influential predictive factors as to what tells us if the offender's going to reoffend. And we have a bit of, if a data scientist was here, he'd be able to tell you about how you can fine-tune these models to balance your risk in different places uh, in the system. But, so, so what, actually? There's a bit of now what. So all that sort of stuff is in the laboratory, isn't it? A lot of testing with statistics and algorithms and, and computers. But there comes a point where you have to do a live trial of this, and, it, and your algorithm meets human contact, doesn't it? From the person who's using it, and the person who's going to be on the end of the decision, and what will actually l that look like in a field context. So uh, what I did uh, with this, a little time ago now, did 12 uh, semi-structured one-to-one um, interviews across a range of professionals, and I ran 10 focus groups as well that covered pretty much the whole range of professional response to domestic abuse, from frontline cop attending through to investigation, safeguarding, offender management, uh, and then uh, some of our victim services providers, uh, some of our commissioners of victim services, children's services, adult services and local authority professionals to get a sense of what people thought of that. And I haven't themed it up, but some themes have come out of this which uh, you know, are, are, are not exactly new and are replicated across uh, other areas where machine learning is, is, is used to make decisions. But I thought the one on the top left uh, is, is really interesting where we talk about domestic abuse as a human condition and human responses and how can algorithms, by their very nature, be cognizant of that? Uh, that's the title, obviously, of the tutorial. Quite a lot of cops in the room thought that would be really useful if they could use that hand-in-hand hand with the DASH risk assessment. You know, where is my independent information at the point of contact from, uh, you know, about the perpetrator? Because in that, in that set of circumstances, no one is going to get on a computer while the cop's waiting and try and trace through 11 years' worth of data and come up with a cogent... Um, responses to the risk posed by the perpetrator. So friend to discretion. Um, talk about the importance of professional um, judgment. People are concerned about where the victim voice is. And as we move over to this, we talk about people wanting to know how it's built, what's in it, how transparent we are. Are we going to show that risk assessment and explain it to the perpetrator? Because we do that with our current risk assessments, assessing perpetrator behaviour in a in a setting uh, outside of a, a, a police point of contact. Um, there's an interesting one over on, on the top right. We, in the UK, we have something called Claire's Law, where under certain circumstances, the police can go and uh, visit a potential victim of domestic abuse uh, and, and, and tell her, if it's a female, uh, how dangerous her partner is, even before they've committed an offence. We can go and tell them that. So, and the point someone's making on, on the far right um, side in the top is okay then well, if we're going to do that are we going to say I know that because my algorithm told me and here's the scores and you know professionals debated as to whether that was of any value uh, or not and how on earth would you explain that um, and then we talk about uh, this um,
concept of uh, you know the computer uh, pretty much uh, getting us in a position where no one will go against what the computer automation bias is called, isn't it? No one will go against the the output of the computer. Police officers will either be too scared to go against it, or some people would argue they'd see this shiny new toy and think it was the next best thing and think they were they were always going to use it. Um, my research said that's not the case. Actually, there was a fine balance in the cops between the cops in the room who thought this, a supportive friend um, to discretion, uh, and others thought that, well, you know, I don't really care what the algorithm says because I'm going to do what I think is the best thing to do in the circumstances that I'm faced with. And in fact, we had one police officer who said, I've got X amount of years of experience. When I walk into a domestic abuse, I will tell you in under nine seconds what the risk is, and I'm always right. Which I'd suggest is pretty arrogant, really, isn't it, to be honest. Let, let's face it. Um, so th those are the considerations coming, coming out of um, users and victim advocates and, and perpetrator advocates, which I thought was important that we, that we share. And so what does all that mean then? Um, when we link back to Marion's point, uh, and which Marion's going to come up in a minute, and we fast forward to using this in the field, what does that mean in legal terms for the use of police officer discretion and how might that be guided? So, so over to you, Marion. Thank you. A bit of law now, and I, I promise, as I said earlier, that I will be quite brief so that we can get on to the case study and allow you to have um, a bit of discussion in your groups. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the legal framework within England and Wales that focuses on discretion. Um, and I'm quite a big fan of looking back at old law, as I've called it, to, to help guide our algorithmically assisted future rather than thinking we need a whole new legal framework um, uh, to, to help us. So this, this diagram is intended to illustrate the, the legal um, framework called administrative law uh, within England and Wales, which is there to make sure that the public sector makes legitimate and valid and lawful decisions and it and it's got uh, various facets to it um, the one at the top there uh, natural justice and the duty to give reasons is all about explainability so it very much links to one of our fat themes um, irrelevant and relevant considerations is all about making sure that public sector officials only make judgments based on information that's relevant to the decision in hand so they don't take uh, accounts of irrelevant stuff and again that's very relevant to our fat themes and the third one there is all about fettering that's a great word great old-fashioned word um, fettering your discretion so um, not doing something that means you're not uh, taking a, a decision based on all, all the relevant information and all the things you should be considering. So before we get onto that aspect, just very briefly on, on this key issue of whether um, the output of an algorithm is actually a relevant decision. Um, Dave has explained um, the ins and outs of how his algorithm in development operates. But if that is going to go into an operational environment, we still need to ask, is it, is it, should it be considered by an officer in their decision making? Is it a relevant factor to their ultimate decision? And this very much links with the explainability. How, how does the officer know that it's relevant unless they know a bit about how that output has been generated. There's a, a famous case in, in England and Wales called Doody, which is all, all about actually challenging the Home Secretary's decision. But in that judgment, um, the, the, the court said that um, the, the, the claimant there needed to know how the Home Secretary's mind is working in order to be able to challenge the decision. And it seems to me that the same applies to algorithms. We need to know how their minds are working in order to be able to decide whether their outputs are relevant. 
we hear a lot about accuracy rates, 90% accurate, it's all these sort of terms banded around. But what does that percentage hide in terms of false positives, um, false negatives, and perhaps the factors that have been used to generate that result? Um, I've put a quote up here from um, an article by Richard Burke, uh, who's a great proponent of statistical um, methods in criminal justice. And I think he might have been slightly tongue-in-cheek when he said, if other things equal shoe size is a useful predictor of recidivism, I find it quite hard to say that, then it can be included as a predictor. Why shoe size matters in, is in, immaterial. Um, now, I think that if we were looking back to our key legal framework there about whether it's relevant or not, we would say that to recidivism, shoe size is not a relevant consideration. So if our algorithm was using that, is, it, is the output therefore a relevant consideration for the police officer? I'd probably say no. So the fettering discretion issue could be um, summarised as the computer says no problem, or as Gary Kasparov quite nicely put it, the problem comes when the database and the engine go from coach to oracle. Uh, or, as Cook and Mitchie commented, it's difficult for the decision maker to disregard the number and alter their evaluation even if presented with detailed, credible and contradictory information. So all those, all those factors are feeding into the question as to whether the decision maker is potentially fettering their discretion when using an algorithm. <coughs> the key point I think around this legal framework is that the valid exercise of discretion, as we talked about earlier, requires a genuine application of the mind and a conscious choice by the correct authority. So that raises a number of challenges for algorithms, but also potential benefits as well. As we said earlier, the police are operating in conditions of uncertainty, so algorithms do have the potential to package relevant factors in a way that could facilitate more efficient decision-making and so contribute relevant analysis into a decision-making process. But machine learning systems are consistently subjective. Um, Jennifer Cobb commented that they are not good at facilitating consideration of the particulars of the case in hand. So they may, may present challenges where you've got a decision-making environment where you're, you're coming across very different circumstances in each case. There is this risk of fettering discretion if the, if the machine learning tool only takes certain factors into account, for example, those that might indicate risk and, or those that can be easily codified into a tool. Or perhaps if the scores are packaged in a very unnuanced way, um, so not allowing the risk to be the human judgment but it ends up being the, the algorithmic judgment. Perhaps this sort of risk of a binary type of approach might um, eliminate any power that the human has got to deal with the hard cases, the cases that are different from the norm. And it might result in nervousness about taking action contrary to the, to the recommendation. And that's been um, highlighted in a number of pieces of research um, within the UK recently. So, as I said in um, an article that I published in 2018, these questions based on risk and legal concepts such as reasonableness present a challenge for algorithms um, to present a model that is genuinely able to reflect the complexity of an indiv individual circumstances. And that's why real practical considerations such as design are so important because the design um, affects the way that we react to the output and the tool in question. 
This screenshot is from um, quite a well-known um, tool that's in operational use within the UK, um, the HEART tool that was implemented by Durham Constabulary. Um, and some of you may have seen various news articles and other things around, around it. I think the Durham are now very fed up with answering questions about this tool. But this is um, from a documentary that the, the BBC ran about this algorithmic tool. It's designed to help police officers assess offenders and their potential risk of offending in the future in order to be able to triage them onto a rehabilitation program. So as you can see from this screenshot, um, a very prominent traffic lighting system is used. Either you see green for a low risk category, orange for a medium risk category, or red for a high risk category. And then you are reminded underneath in the writing that you probably can't read, that you need also to go away and look at other policing systems in order to get other information that might be relevant to your decision. Now, when we get into our discussion uh, section, you might want to have a think about this way of presenting the information to the police officer and whether you think this is um, upholding the officer's discretion, being that friend to the discretion, or, or not. And I'm not going to comment on that. Well, we might at the end. Well, we might, yeah. So finally, um, being a friend to discretion, the decision-making process of which this tool is only part must pre preserve the human discretion to assess the unthought of relevant factors. And in my view, it can't be inserted, it shouldn't be inserted into a process in a way that takes away that legitimate discretion from, from the human decision maker. So I'm going to hand back over to Dave now. He's going to, um, yes, before we do that, question. Yes. Yeah, of course. Ah, well, can I just answer that? Because um, we probably need to move on to the... We, we will come back to this point, but what your question raises a very um, interesting point that has been debated a lot within, within the UK in terms of what is the role of the police. And I think... Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be um, The uh, number of forces have responded to that sort of criticism, saying that the criticism being that uh, you shouldn't have a preventative role, your role should only be after the event, in, uh, to say that actually, no, that is the role of the police. Preventing crime is a role of the police, and therefore this sort of tool is used f for specifically that sort of role and trying to allocate the resources to that. You might want to respond. But, um, yeah, so can I just finish the... Yeah. That was kind of like the yeah. setup of the question. And then so then my question is then, okay, so let's say even long-term that is or meta goal of the police. Um, I think, do you think that police is best having this information or is it people who are trying to integrate um, ex-felons back to the society, psychologists, uh, prisons, um, you know, like, are we going to take this so that we can make sure that, you know, is this an algorithm yeah. for locking more people, you know, or is it an algorithm for helping people commit less crimes? And this is a very tough question, but it's a tough space. Mm, I, sorry, I can cover that. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. do I can cover oh, that, just I can to cover say that, now. that absolutely. Cover that now. Yeah. Yeah, try, yeah. I'll try and be. Yeah. What is the time, by the way? It's half past, so we've got enough time. All right, okay, out. so yeah. the role of the police, statutory legal authority for the police to prevent crime. And if you go back 200 years in British policing, Sir Robert Peel, first Peelian principle, prevent you know, crime in the first instance. The absence of crime is success in itself. And uh, we use lots of information to prevent crime already. So we have homicide prevention strategy. If I think you're going to com commit a murder, I will get a surveillance authority and potentially follow you. I might listen to your phone calls, telephone intercept, to find a point of intervention to stop you doing it. 
In terms of the algorithmic output, no, no one should ever uh, follow someone based on an algorithm because you need uh, a different authority for that. But the output of the algorithm could be uh, a set of data or a set of information that is used to support a case. Uh, but that particular point, of course, hasn't really been tested anywhere, has it? And, and, and needs to be, and you're absolutely right. In answer to the kind of the multi-agency question, I think uh, that uh, output is potentially usable across the entire criminal justice spectrum, because I, I take your point. Um, you can only use this tool for information you've got access to in a live environment. And in a live environment, we don't access any of those other agencies' data. So it's about making our decision making consistent at the point of contact, but being very clear when we hand it to another agency that we know there'll be gaps in the information that are missing. So at the moment, just for us, the future is all that data from those other agencies should be used to improve the quality of the output. And then it's up to individuals and agencies how they decide to use that in a proper framework to get, to get value out of it. Does that make, does that make sense? I mean, you, know, you may not agree, but does it make sense? Different, different labeling they might want to use, different data that would be yeah. meaningful for them. Yeah. So generalizing a uh, product to be used by the whole criminal justice pipeline, that's not a thing, right? You're going to have to have different yeah. products. I'm that not you generalizing might that. I'm yeah, just yeah, saying yeah. there's a potential to yeah. use really valuable data in yeah. that algorithm that has a use for lots of different agencies, but the specific use has to be clear and it has to have a purpose. And the other bit, um, I would love to use that output to not lock up offenders, yeah. but identify those offenders who might benefit from a non-criminal justice intervention around behavior and things like that. And I think so then that my do. second question would be, uh, what are the metrics that you're going to use to make sure that your algorithm isn't bringing more you know, bad than good? And when I say that, then I mean, uh, yeah, maybe the occurrence of crimes isn't a good enough metric because you might just be locking everyone up, right? And maybe that's not what you... So have you thought about those things? Right. We, don't, we don't do that. No. Anyway, no. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, and th there's a number of metrics you might want to use around the algorithm depending on what you're trying to um, measure, isn't there? So, I mean, I think it's a really easy metric. If you say that algorithmic output says you're not going to offend and they offend, that's a pretty good uh, metric at scale as to how effective that risk assessment is if it's dependent on an output. Some of the trickier ones are when, when you're getting into the bit up at high risk where you say someone's uh, going to not or, or will offend because there's a whole load of interventions that go on post that. But what we can't do, what we can't do is allow you and I debate we're having now to dominate this entire tutorial. So yeah, I'm no, really happy okay, to and I'm, and I'm going to end. need to yeah. move on yeah. to the next bit of the yeah. tutorial. And then th these sort of questions can actually, yeah. the intention would be that these sort of questions can come out in yeah. that oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 yeah, if that's definitely. right. Yeah. So, here we, so, um, hang on a minute. Let me come back to that one. So, of course, what, when I make the point is that, you know, it, it, your algorithm can be 100% accurate. Um, but at some point, it's got to be used in the hands of a human being. Uh, and it's that that we want to explore in the next um, 30 minutes, really. So I've got a case study uh, scenario uh, that will follow. It's in two parts. Um, and I'll talk you through it. But I think we're going to try and split into four groups. Is that right, yeah. Marion? We're going to split into four groups. Uh, and in the first scenario, uh, each of the groups will only have to answer one question. So group one, question one. Group two, question two, etc. Uh, and, and there are the questions on the screen. Uh, the first question I'm going to highlight uh, in particular. When an organisation deploys a police officer in the field and they're going to give them a new risk assessment, a new bit of shiny kit, what does the implementing organisation have to do to support the best use of that kit in the hands of a police officer at the point of contact? Yeah? It's a bit like throwing a dart at a dartboard. There's a whole load of considerations that go behind that throw to make it hit the bullseye. So what's the implementing organisation need to think about to make sure it's hitting the bullseye with the use of its risk assessment? And the questions two, three and four um, to follow. And um, hopefully they're clear without me reading them all out. And what I'll do is I'll do the scenario. We've got a paper handout for the four groups, so you've got it in hard copy. And then whilst you're discussing it, I'll go back to the screen so the questions are on there. Is that, is that clear? Got that? 
So this, this is a fairly typical domestic abuse scenario. So here we are uh, in, in Southampton, uh, city uh, in Hampshire. It's got a population of about a quarter of a million. Uh, I haven't put in the numbers for crimes and incidents and deployments uh, waiting, but the crimes and incidents per day are in the hundreds. Uh, domestic abuse incidents per day uh, are high. Um, and on an average busy shift for uh, the city of Southampton, after about 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening, is about 14 cops responding to calls. There'd be some other cops doing some other stuff, but responding to calls, about 14. Sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but about uh, 14. And every time one of those cops gets deployed on a late shift to a, a job, there will be another one in a queue waiting for them. And they go from job to job to job to job. Sometimes they're, they're redeployed. So uh, in our contact centre, we've got a call for service, 999, female call. I've been assaulted by a partner. Perpetrator is present in the house. This makes this an immediate emergency response, but in a separate room. So we've been dispatched. And when we go and see our victim, there are no visible injuries. So this is not unusual. Discloses a verbal only argument. So it hasn't disclosed a physical assault. But remember, if we go back to uh, my honeycomb, for the original risk assessment, we talk about coercive control, uh, which doesn't necessarily need to mean need a uh, physical assault. She doesn't make a formal allegation had a few drinks, might be intoxicated, that's not untypical, uh, for victim and perpetrator, I should add. Um, and a very quick check at the address, and often this is all the time the control room have to do, is a quick address check. There's been one previous verbal domestic at the address in the last three months. So the officer is able to fill out a um, dash risk assessment. It's not getting a lot of information because our, our victim doesn't feel comfortable speaking. And it's standard. And the way the officer will interpret that, if he just went by the risk assessment, is there's, there's no risk here. Our perpetrator, as they often are, calm and unflustered. Nothing to see here. Uh, says verbal argument only. Quick check of previous convictions. That's convictions in court, not any previous arrests. Um, none, no previous convictions. But there is one uh, check in the last year which shows an assault for domestic abuse with a previous partner. So police officer is under pressure to redeploy. Uh, they're not thinking there's a great deal of risk that they can see here, uh, but they're a bit suspicious and probably think they want to take some further action. They need to make a decision. Fortunately, in this case, they have on hand a very powerful algorithmic output to assist in, it in their discretion. And it's actually come out to say, no, hold on, your dash says standard, low risk. Actually, our algorithm says medium risk. This perpetrator will offend again in the domestic abuse setting within the next two years. Uh, but it's not going to be at your highest harm. It's non-serious. So I think if we go back to the, the officer's got to make a decision now, which is where this part of the scenario ends. And if we go back, your considerations there as so to what needs to happen to help that officer make the best decision and the best use, the fairest use of that algorithm in that set of circumstances. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which one, how should we divide this up? It's pretty quite easy, isn't it? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, what set of decisions are available to an officer in these All cases? right, a good, really good question. So, um, arrest, in this circumstances, arrest or uh, not arrest. That, that's effectively it. Yeah. The, the, there's other decisions that will come into play in the second part of this scenario later on down the line, which you need to consider. Is he going to arrest the perpetrator purely on the basis of this effectively this algorithm and, and the verbal argument that's been presented. I'm sorry, can I have a follow-up yeah. question to that? Is if he is arresting based on a verbal argument, then what are the charges? Well, the, the, there's a number of charges he can do in that because he could, actually, the police officer could go with the original call to the control room. Yeah? Assaulted by a partner. Yeah? So but when they go to court, they're not going to have that well, partner there not in too. Court. So a police officer to make a decision to arrest doesn't need any evidence. They just need reasonable grounds to suspect that an offence has been committed. Right, but what does that serve if he's going to get out after well, he's arraigned? So, uh, right. So if you make an arrest of a domestic abuse setting, a number of things are achieved. Number one, you take the perpetrator out of the setting and you give the victim time to diffuse, get her in a safe setting, and the ability then to talk through that risk assessment where she's reluctant to engage here when the perpetrator is present. And we know that if we can buy time for victims and get time, that risk assessment and what they disclose will change. 
So we might uncover a whole load of information. When you have someone back in custody, the investigative process starts. So you can actually ask the perpetrator what they've done. You might do some house-to-house -house inquiries while the perpetrator is in custody, and that investigation will progress. And as you'll see in scenario two, there are a whole load of statutory orders outside of prosecution that can be applied in this set of circumstances which are triggered by an arrest. But then that does trigger the question of whether you're arresting based on the allegation of assault, which you may not believe or may not have evidence for, or on the assessment from your tool. But reasonable grounds to suspect. Yeah, and the officer, but in uh, court, no, we're not that's in court. not going... No, we're, not, we're not in court. Well, I'm a defense attorney, so right, okay. no, wait, I would make the argument in court that yeah. you were not arresting him okay. based well, on what was actually... Suggest that that actually could be something you could consider in your in group groups. And, and actually uh, yeah. highlight that because yeah. that is um, a very good yeah. point. Yeah. That yeah. Could yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so, so good. debate it in the um, I'm going to, to divide you up into your groups yeah. now and then we'll allocate each group one of the questions if yeah. we go back to those. Okay. Different law in the UK, guys. Yeah. Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Okay, so if we can have um, these three, first three rows of one group, so you'll have ten now and then the first. Um, if we can have the This is group one. Yeah, I think there was there's lots of debate going on in this group. No conclusion. Yeah. Yep. We can raise two points. Uh, one of the important points, like we were thinking, uh, uh, was that we are jumping over a bigger question uh, here, like uh, what 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 we are using and why we are developing such algorithm. Uh, and uh, what are the data that we are using and so it's like much more important than how we support it. But on the support uh, part also there are some, some points. So. Yeah, uh, we believe also that uh, if we can uh, use uh, this kind of algorithm, every step uh, sh should be uh, to be clear that the responsibility is uh, not on the algorithm, but on the computer, the, the police officer that uh, decide to arrest or, or know a person. So uh, this is must be the, the first point that be, be must be clear. And the other one point that uh, um, emerged from the very first uh, part of the discussion is about explainability. So we believe that uh, if the algorithm can provide also an explanation of why or the medium risk, why the, the, the situation give a medium risk, and then maybe another additional information about uh, that, that particular feature that uh, give uh, the, this risk, it could be easier for the police officer to be m less biased uh, and consider the whole uh, picture. Put a question back on the. Um, put a question back on the. What are the algorithmic design decisions features which may help or hinder the professional in the legitimate exercise of their discretion? Okay, so I'll summarize for the group, but correct me if I say something that is wrong. Um, but I think one of the first things that came up was this idea that the very fact of having an algorithm may or may not lend you know more confidence to an officer when making a decision. 
Um, and that might be um, ill-deserved confidence. It may not uh, lead to a better outcome uh, for all the parties involved. And so, and so that, that presents a danger in and of itself. And then the other thing we talked about was um, in terms of algorithmic design, decisions and features was um, that certain stakeholders ought to be present uh, during the design of the algorithm. So we talked about like community leaders being there and we also spent a good amount of time talking about uh, the disabled community or um, communities who might be uh, you know, disproportionately targeted by domestic abuse. Um, so yeah, is there anything else? Sorry, this is Lydia. We also discussed other factors, a couple of us, that would not be considered by an algorithm even if one were adopted as part of a decision-making process and what some of those might look like. Did we want to expand on that? Sorry? I just think that, that last point really key because as we were talking about earlier, um, a lot of the algorithms will only datafy certain types of um, factors, those that show risk or those that can be codified. So how, how is the process going to incorporate um, those other, other really important key factors around the individual that need to be taken into consideration? Um, so now group three is over here. Um, so ours was the third one, which was really about the inputs and explanations. Uh, so we had a, f a few points, I think, uh, one was similar to the other group, which we were concerned about the choice of the output variable, uh, and that uh, one issue maybe that if past officer behavior can influence uh, whether or not the, the, basically the validity of the data that you're using. Um, because reoffense inherently means that somebody had to have uh, been arrested in prior incidents, and there's lots of reasons to believe that that's not random. Um, we talked a, a lot about the cutoff for low, medium, and high risk and making that decision and how that might influence the, both the officer decisions but also the somewhat arbitrariness of how you decide what low, medium, and high risk are. Um, and then we talked uh, quite a bit about uh, static versus dynamic factors. So uh, do the variables that are included in the model allow people to uh, find interventions that could be useful that are not a rest. Uh, and I think the last bit we talked about was it might be useful for the officer and for the algorithm to be able to explain individual decisions in that moment, especially in a case like the one you showed, so that they could decide whether or not to choose that medium high risk as somebody worth arresting. Okay, thank you. And that, that point you make about that dynamic piece, uh, when we did our focus groups, that, that came out loud and clear, as you say, it, you know, you see at the bottom between applying static risk factors and actually what's happening in front of you and what's, what's dynamic. And as described, it's a minefield, which it is. Okay. Right, group four. Okay, yes, yeah, so uh, we were discussing about um, the user interface design, um, and we said that perhaps it would be more useful uh, to not output a specific, um, say, okay, you should definitely arrest this person, they are high risk, but perhaps give like uh, a value, like a score of some kind to guide their decision, but not say this is the decision that we think you should make. Um, maybe we the algorithm can add like the criteria that lead to the outcome. So the police officer can make up his mind like why I have on my screen this score and why I should arrest this person. So Great, thank you. Should we, I know we've only got um, a very small number of minutes left. Yeah. Should we just move on to the second uh, part? Yeah, and then just a point of I, I think I need to make this really important point for clarification, that the algorithm will never, never ever tell someone what to do. So it, it won't say, you must arrest. Uh, what it'll do is provide that data that allows you to assess the risk factors in making a, making a decision. Um, so I just think that's 
quite important for us. And also accepting that you know, we have a lot of different legal powers in our jurisdiction and lots of other people do maybe. So, go on before I move on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I think we really should be focused from the student perspective because you really lived it first hand and I think your model as well. It starts from individual risk factors and protective factors, but you have the dynamic between two individuals which usually leads to violence. So when you separate these two people and place them in another relationship, even though the individual factors, they might not lead to the same situation. So I think that event perspective would be very interesting to incorporate in a risk assessment model, but I don't know if that would be anything I for any of us. And also the, the distinction between perpetrator and victim is rather artificial because common couple, viola common couple violence is the most yep. uh, common form of yep. domestic violence. Yep. So I think that might also be a difficulty in the in the model, in the in, in the instruments. Yeah, but very diff uh, situational violence, very difficult to unpick that actually. Um, right, should we move on then? So these are the three questions just for this scenario that moves on. We may, we may get, um, a lot of similar answers, uh, we may not, but I just want to try and focus you down in this particular case on these three groups. So I'll show you the scenario in a second. What are the design decision features which may help offering a professional explain the reasons explain the reasons to the victim? So not just about their own decision, but to the victim, to the perpetrator, and any legal professionals they may have to engage and interact with in the next scenario. Uh, again, data inputs explanation, again, for those three groups of people, and again, the user interface design and interaction, victim and perpetrator. Some people may think that you know, different groups require different information, but just be interested in your, in your take on this, which again is not atypical at all. So, the officer had a look at that algorithm, looked at the circumstances in front of him, weighed it all up, and thought, I'm gonna arrest you. Uh, for, because I think actually what the victim said in their initial call to police was actually what happened. And on my reasonable grounds to suspect, I'm gonna make that arrest. When you book someone into our custody, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act says you have to tell the custody sergeant the reasons as to why you made that arrest. Explain what's happening in your brain when you um, did it, because otherwise we're not legally compliant. So, but what do we tell the perpetrator for the reasons as to why they were arrested? Because they should understand that as well. And what is the legal representative who's now turned up at the custody block uh, want to know? So, you know, in your case, which buttons are you going to be pushing down at the um, cell block? So the perpetrator is interviewed, denies the assault. There is insufficient evidence to charge. So uh, we would be on the phone to the CPS, make a dis charging decision or not. Uh, but at this point, insufficient evidence to charge. So actually, we have to release the perpetrator. But in the UK we have some statutory uh, notices we can serve on domestic abuse perpetrators to uh, prevent them contacting the victim in the hours, days, and weeks immediately after the offence. The reason being, because many victims change their mind and will re-engage if they've got that space. And they're called domestic violence protection notices. So uh, we've got insufficient evidence to charge our um, suspected perpetrator, but we don't really want to let him back into that scenario and we think the victim needs more time after we've spoken to her. We could use Claire's Law, so we could explain what we think the dangerousness of the perpetrator is, and how we think we know that through our algorithm. Could we or couldn't we? We could also apply, through the court, the domestic violence protection notice that would stop that perpetrator returning to the address and engaging with the victim to allow us to um, help her out. Um, that requires, in order for us to do a domestic violence protection notice, we need some legal authority for that. We need a senior police officer to authorise, then we'd need to go to court to get permission to use that. What would we present to the court? Um, and we've got here, it's authorised. The perpetrator, is, uh, sorry, the police officer re-engages with the victim, manages to obtain a witness statement, further arrests the perpetrator and a prosecution follows. And then you're back into that feedback loop. So we've you know, collected a piece of data now on a perpetrator, which goes back into the algorithm, and so the loop goes on. So, so really, for, for you guys, it's those first four pieces there on interaction with the perpetrator, interaction with the victim, interaction with the legal process, and then those questions. Does that make sense? And, and try and focus 
really narrowly down on those three groups of people and what is specific to them that we might, may or may not want to want to talk about. Thank you very much. How long have we got? One minute. <laughs> so I think uh, if, if the groups could just maybe just think very quickly about one key point they'd like to make yeah, in right. relation to that second part of the scenario, I think that would yeah. be useful. Group one, point one. Who's group one? Who's group one? Maybe just anybody who'd oh, like anybody. to make a point. Anybody. That might be the best way of yeah. doing it, yeah. I think in response to question one, that's something, I mean, approaching the person who is in this scenario identifying as a victim um, or being identified as a victim by the police and telling them that this is how we came up with this difference, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know in most situations whether that would work. They probably um, may have known about that prior incident that is changing someone from being low risk to medium risk. And I, I sort of, not, I'm not sure what influencing factors that would have. Um, and not sure whether they would feel more or less confident, at least in that moment, about their decision not to make a statement. Any other comments? I think everybody wants to go, uh, go for drinks. Uh, I'm quite well <laughs> so as well. It's quarter past six in Barcelona. Um, any, any other comment anybody wants to make about any of that? No? Nope? All right. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, oh one. <laughs> Go on. I mean, uh, I, I guess the, the whole tutorial around that skipped the point that uh, we are making an algorithm based on extremely biased data. Uh, and uh, we are now, like, in this scenario, uh, the fa first arrest could have been wrong, which is very common, could have been discriminatory. And then all these decisions comes after that, then you are high risk. This is very known effect in the society and it was just ignored here. So like, yeah, I guess uh, the, the whole idea around this uh, needs rethinking. That's a really good point, but none of that's ignored in everything we've done. The, the whole point is to draw it out of you and get your opinions on things like that. So I'm really glad that you raised that. So yeah, I mean, yeah. like, yeah. but yeah, it, it it would have been more useful, at least for me, if I was uh, listening to how they uh, they decided how how they made a uh, better algorithm, uh, getting rid of the bias in the data. Yeah. Considering that, uh, like, yeah. More, more of the data science then is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, be behind um, the algorithm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fair enough. Thank Can you. I just make a point about that? I think that the, the focus of this tutorial was very much around the decision making process, as we said in the abstract. So it was around the fact that these tools could have the imp impact on the, on the decision making discretion of the officer. And, um, Obviously, data data quality is a factor that would have an impact on that, and it's something that we hoped would come out in the discussion. So it's good that it did. Um, and some of so some of the explainability factors around that are really really key. But the um, the the whole point of this um, tutorial was really to focus on that that discretion aspect rather than looking some of the other aspects, because we don't, just didn't have time to look at all those. No, no, sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great.